Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Merchants Trust PLC Investor Presentation. This presentation is being hosted on Research Tree by Docio and Cattle Access Group. Uh, during this recorded session, investors will be in listen-only mode. We encourage you to submit questions, which you can do at any time via the Q&A tab on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just type in the question and press send. Um, while presenters may not get to respond to every question during the meeting itself, they will review them and, where appropriate, publish responses. These responses will be on the event page of Research Tree shortly after this presentation. Um, but before I hand over, um, just to say there'll be an opportunity for you to leave feedback at the end, so please stay on at the end of the call just a little bit and you'll be directed to the feedback page. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand the baton to Simon Gurgle. Over to you, Simon. Well, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be speaking to you today about the Merchants Trust. Um, and I'll be speaking for 15 to 20 minutes and then taking questions. Um, what I'm going to cover today is an overview for the Trust. I'll talk about the investment process in a bit of detail. I'll talk a little bit about Outlook and how we are positioning the portfolio today. And then I'll talk about very important areas, which are dividends and performance. Um, moving straight on to the overview. The first thing to say is we think the UK equity market is a great place to in invest because you get high standards of corporate governance and you get expo uh, a good dividend tradition and good exposure to industries and, and, and activities around the world. Many companies are very international, so it's a good mix in the UK. And Merchants Trust is trying to invest predominantly in the UK in, in predominantly large cap companies. Uh, it has a, a dividend yield of around about 5%. We are an AIC dividend hero, which means we've grown the dividend every year for 41 years. And we have significant reserves, and I'll come back to that. We have a strong performance record driven by an active, high conviction, and value-driven stock selection approach. Um, and, and again, that's, that's quite differentiated. Value has been a tricky place to be in the last decade or so, but we've still delivered great uh, performance. And we have a low management fee, one of the lowest in the sectors, and a strong independent board of directors, and delighted to take questions on that if there are. Just in terms of a few facts and figures, uh, our objective is to deliver a high and rising income stream um, and, and good total return, uh, investing predominantly in large cap companies. We've got about 900 million of gross assets um, and uh, gearing of about 12 or 13, 14 percent at the moment. Gearing is, is borrowing, and I'll come back to that, but investment trusts can borrow in, in order to uh, hopefully deliver a better return in the long term. So if I move quickly on to the investment process, and this is probably the heart of, of what we're doing and what, we, what we're going to talk about today, um, it's a fairly simple investment philosophy. We, we think fundamentally that markets are driven by human emotions, by, by fear and greed, and that therefore, if you have a value approach and try and buy materially undervalued companies, that you can make good money because the market tends to overshoot both on when, when people get too optimistic, they push share prices too high, and that can be a good time to sell. And, and more, more importantly, if people get too pessimistic about a company, you see it all the time, shares prices go down a lot and you can find great opportunities to make money by buying companies when they're materially undervalued. In order to do this, however, you need to be very disciplined. Uh, we tend to um, be quite opportunistic because we want to buy good companies when they're cheap and they don't always, often good companies are not cheap uh, for, for obvious reasons. We tend to run fairly high conviction, high concent highly concentrated portfolios. And we tend to be a bit of a contrarian. We, we don't set out to be contrarian. But if you want to buy genuinely good companies when they're out of fa when they're when they're cheap, there's usually a reason why they're out of favor. So they tend to be contrarian opportunities. The other thing that's really important with this philosophy is to control risk. And we think about risk very carefully at the individual company level in three ways. The operational risk, what could go wrong with the business? Um, financial risk, how much leverage have they got? What could go wrong financially? And then valuation risk. If you pay too much for a company, you can lose money, even if it's a, a great business, if it gets derated. And then we think about risk at the portfolio level, and we have various things we look at, as well as sectors and stock positions. It's issues like how much of the portfolio is international versus domestic, how much is cyclical versus uh, defensive. Those type of factors are really important for, UK, for investing in the UK stock market. Income is important. Clearly, Merchants Trust is a high income trust. Now, you might think that if you're investing for income, you're going to sacrifice something. If you want money today, if you want income back today, 
you're going to be giving up getting a lower return in the long run because you're taking more money out in the short term. Uh, historically, actually, that's not really been the case. And the chart on this page shows the US market over various decades, the last nine decades. And in most of those decades, buying high yielding shares and selling low yielding shares has delivered a better total return, which might be slightly counterintuitive. The one decade where it didn't work is the last one to, 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 uh, to 2021, when actually uh, income shares uh, perform very poorly compared to the average. And, and actually, I see that as a great opportunity now because income shares and value shares generally are extremely cheap compared to the rest of the market. So I think that what, what we've seen in the last decade when interest rates were virtually zero for most of that period is quite unusual. So I think income investing has historically delivered good returns. Having said that, we are very conscious that not every share with a high yield is a good investment. Many, many are not. Many are value traps. What we try to do, therefore, is we try to fish in that pond. We try to buy high yielding companies, but we only buy companies where we think we can make good money. We think we're looking for the total return. And so the yield is never a reason for buying a share or selling a share. It's always driven. Our investment decisions are driven by total return considerations. And, and for the same reason, we won't automatically sell a share if the yield goes down, either because the shares perform well or because the dividend is cut. That's not a reason for selling. So just wanted to put that on the table. Happy to take questions on that as well. What we do look for in a company is really three things. We want to buy companies with strong fundamentals, which are um, uh, an attractive industry structure, a strong competitive position, um, a, a, a robust financial profile, a, a good management team. And we want to understand environmental, social and, and governance issues. I'll, I'll come back to that. So we want good businesses. We want to buy companies when we think they're trading below what they're really worth. So we focus a lot on valuation. And, and in particular, we look at cash. We think cash and free cash generation is probably the best measure, single measure. But there are other, ma other measures as well like asset backing. So we want good companies that are cheap. And then I think where our investment process is slightly differentiated is we then say that's not enough. We ideally want companies that have long-term supportive themes and trends, uh, or maybe even short-term cyclical trends that are supportive. So for example, demographics, digitalization, you know, you know, big themes that can make a big difference to companies over the long term. The ideal company is a, is a strong business, it's a cheap business, but also a business with supportive long-term trends. That's what the ideal sweet spot of what we're looking for. <clears throat> and then if I uh, just cover environmental, social and governance risks, we spend a lot of time looking at and, and trying to consider sustainability in the wider context. We have certain restrictions on, on coal and controversial weapons. These don't account for much of the UK market, to be honest. But we do at the individual company level, if we're making an investment, we look at what are the risks on, on, on environment, on social, on governance. And if there's a high risk, we have to be very careful and we have to um, take that into consideration in our investment process. And again, I can talk about that in more detail if people have questions. Um, the other thing we do is we engage with businesses. It's not, not enough just to say there's an issue there. We will then engage with companies to try and ensure that they are um, managing these risks and aware of them and, and hopefully mitigating these issues and, and hopefully improving the business for the long term as well. So that's so that's our approach. Um, just to give you an example of a stock that we've bought in the last uh, six to 12 months is a company called Pets at Home. Uh, many of you will know this retailer with the big green signs on the front of their shops. They're the UK's leading pet retailer company and they uh, you know, are selling everything from food and accessories uh, to, you know, to, to toys and, and, uh, and, and medicines. What's unique about Pets at Home is they also own a very large vet, veterinary business yeah, through a joint venture structure, which is quite unique. So they are, I think, the second biggest vet company in the UK. And that joint, that, that cross-fertilization is really powerful. Customers going into the shop can also get services for their uh, pet care and grooming and that type of service um, and vice versa. And veterinary businesses are really powerful business with uh, with good growth dynamics and and um, uh, and a lot of potential. So we think that's a very strong business, good fundamentals. Some of the themes at pet care are the theme called humanization, which sounds a bit odd, but people are treating their pets more as members of the family. They've moved from being the dogs have moved from being kept in the garden to being kept in the home. They're being given better food, premium foods, but also better quality, better health, nutrition, uh, food 
and and people are treating their pets in a way that's quite different to how it was in the past um and you see that people spending more money on their pet the treatments for pets for, for example the veterinary treatments are getting more sophisticated and more expensive and pets are living longer and also the other theme is it's quite a resilient industry it's not that cyclical people are very reluctant to cut back spending on their pets even in a time of economic hardship so that's all very powerful for an investment case on the valuation side this business has tended to trade at a high valuation but there was an opportunity earlier in the year um, particularly in the end of last year when investors got very nervous about the outlook for retailers in the UK, we had high interest rates and people were concerned, as they are to some extent today, and retail shares share, fell <laughs> very significantly. And there was an opportunity to pick up pets at home at a really attractive and unusual valuation. So we are quite opportunistic, as I said earlier. But that's an example of a company with strong fundamentals, attractive themes, and, and attractive valuation at the time we were buying it. Um, just to put that into context of our overall investment process, so there's really um, four stages. The first is idea generation. We're looking for ideas, predominantly UK income ideas, but we do have a small number of international stocks. We then apply the stock section approach, fundamentals, themes, and valuation I've just talked about. We then build that into a portfolio of sort of 40 to 60 stocks typically um, with a high active share, so highly different, differentiated from the benchmark. We're trying to by companies we really believe in. We don't hold stocks just because they're in the benchmark, but we do think very carefully about risk management. Um, as I said earlier, in terms of how, how we are positioned in areas like cyclicals versus defensives and so on. And bring that all together. And, and then the other thing actually that is really important and investors don't spend as much time talking about so much is the sell discipline, but you can, you can add or lose as much value from the sell discipline. And we're very, very careful and very careful with the, um, we have very, uh, pro we have a you know, rigorous process on the sell discipline. So we will sell a share if the valuation gets too high. In practice, we tend to be quite gradual with that. We will sell a share if the investment case changes or certainly we'll review it if the investment case changes and that's uh, an important discipline. And then thirdly, it may be we sell a share if there are better opportunities elsewhere. And at the moment, there are so many opportunities we are actually having to, to bite into some of the muscle. We have to sell some of the shares we quite like in order to, to uh, make other purchases where we have stronger conviction. And that's a good place to be, actually, in my book. So that's investment pro process. That builds the portfolio um, to where we are today, um, which, which neatly brings me on to outlook and portfolio positioning. Um, I could spend a lot of time talking about the outlook, but we are predominantly bottom-up investors. We are predominantly trying to buy individual companies that we think offer good value. And it's less about the macro environment, but it's still important to understand the pressures on businesses and what's going on. So it is a, it is a very challenging economic backdrop. There is a risk of recession uh, because of the way inflation has been going and interest rates have been ris risen to uh, address that. And I think that's a very real risk. I think companies themselves have been under pressure from a number of very different causes that we've had uh, uncertain demand pressure and there's certainly fears about demand. We've actually had supply issues, particularly in COVID, and those aren't all fully resolved. We've got rising interest rates, which is the first time for many management teams in a generation that we've had debt getting more expensive when you refinance it rather than cheaper. We've got the pressures of deglobalization. Companies have found that they actually need to move their production closer to America or, the, or Europe from particularly Asia and China for political reasons and for environmental reasons. And actually because of the and fragile, fragilities of the supply chain exposed during COVID. And that's adding costs to businesses. And of course, labor costs are rising quite quickly. So there's lots of issues that companies are grappling with. I think on the positive side though, commodity costs have now rolled over, freight costs have come down. Many of the cost pressures that companies have been dealing with have, have gone away or, or are going away albeit labor is still quite, uh, still labor costs are still rising. Unemployment remains low, which is good for the demand backdrop, backdrop for many companies. And bond yield, I put this in a bit earlier, actually, bond yields probably haven't, may not have peaked <laughs> yet, but hopefully we are close to the peak in interest rate expectations, which has been uh, driving sentiment, if nothing else. Um, and, and perhaps the growth outlook will improve. That's probably a bit optimistic, that improving comment, but the growth outlook should improve once we get past the peak of the interest rate cycle. I think what's clear is cyclical shares are priced for recession or priced for a lot of bad news, particularly in the UK market and particularly the medium size and, and um, 
smaller companies and those that are exposed to the domestic economy. There are, and I'll show you some evidence in a minute, there's a lot of very cheap shares around. I think we therefore think the UK is a rich opportunity set and it's been following a lot of outflows of money. And the two charts here on the left, we show outflows in fairly recent the last two or three years from UK funds going negative, whereas global funds have had money going in, in equities. And on the right hand side, a much longer term view, a 40 year view, 50 year view, which shows that 40 years ago, well, I think about 30 years ago, half the market in the UK was owned by pension funds and insurance companies. That's the pink and salmon color and the red color. Uh, those are the insurance companies and pension funds in the UK. They now only own 4%. So they've been selling and international investors, which are the, the dark blue bar, have grown to 50% of the market. Um, now, the good news there is, of course, the pension funds have now sold pretty much everything they had. So the selling pressure should reduce over time. And hopefully we'll get a following wind that, um, you know, there's, there's one, one less headwind that we've had to take on board and the selling pressure should ease over time. Um, just in terms of valuations, on the left-hand side of this, this page, you see the valuation of the UK market compared to other markets globally. UK is trading at about a 40% discount to the world, and that's much bigger discount than it's traded historically. And that discount has widened significantly since the Brexit referendum in 2016. Um, and on the right-hand side, even more interesting for me as an investor is within the market, there's a massive spread of returns. This, this chart on the right shows the gap between growth stocks and value stocks, but it's, it's really a measure of valuation dispersion or differences in the market. Um, and that big negative 60% means there's a 60% gap between what are typical, va typical value stocks and growth stocks, which is as wide as we've ever seen it. It's much wider than it was in the TMT bubble at the turn of the century. So that means the market is really polarized and there's great opportunities for stock pickers to buy uh, cheap companies, which are trading at a big discount to an already quite modestly valued overall market. Um, just to give you some idea of, of the companies we've been buying and selling in the last year, as I say, there's been a lot of opportunities. Some of these are, are global businesses or you know, international businesses like uh, Halion or, or Inchcape, uh, and some of them are more domestic like Admiral or, or Pets at Home, um, uh, and some are cyclical. Most, most of these are relatively cyclical, but some of them are more, more defensive as well. And we've been selling shares where we've seen valuation come through, like BAE Systems has, has been a great performer. HomeServe was taken over. So there's been lots of opportunities on both sides in the last 12 months. Um, just to give you a bit more color on the market. So what we do here is we break down the stock market into PE bands, how much you pay for a pound of profits. So to explain it on the right hand side where you see uh, a, a tall gray bar, 20%. 20% of the market, one in five stocks, is on a price earnings ratio of over 20 in the market. Um, and equally on the low on the low side, um, you know, there's a lot of companies, about 30% of the stock market is on a price earnings, earnings ratio of six to eight percent. So the market is very polarized uh, and that's quite unusual. There's not much in the middle. If you look at our portfolio, the merchants trust, we are very heavily biased towards the left hand side, towards lower priced companies with something like 60, 65% of the portfolio on a price earnings ratio of under 10% or uh, 10 times. And that's, again, that's highly unusual. Um, the question that often follows, and, and overall the portfolio, I should say, is at a big discount to the market. The question that often follows that is, are you buying low quality companies in order to buy cheap stocks? And we would argue we're not. We would argue we're buying a collection of really good businesses. And just to give you some of those names, you can see on this page, this is not the entire portfolio. But it's companies like Pets at Home, but, but many other businesses that have really strong market positions. And this, this page also shows some of the themes. So nutrition and well-being is a, is a broader theme than just Pets at Home and, and Vets. It includes food ingredients like Tate and Lyle. It includes um, consumer health products like Halion's got. Uh, energy transition is a, is, a, is a good area. We've got companies that make copper, which is essential for the energy transition for electrification. We've got companies involved in uh, renewable generation and el electricity transmission. So there's lots of really good companies with attractive end market themes, um, which we which we find good value as well at today in the portfolio. Um, 
I won't I won't stay on this page. This page just shows the top 20 positions and the sector positions, and it may be something we come back to in questions, but a lot of that information is in the public domain. Certainly the report and accounts is a good place to start if you're interested in more information on the, the actual portfolio and, and monthly and monthly fact sheets as well. Um, so I just wanted to cover a couple of areas before I take questions. And these are really important, dividends and performance. Uh, we've grown the dividend at Merchants Trust every year for 41 years. One of the reasons we can do that in investment trust is the directors are able to put away money in good years when income's strong into reserves and draw on those reserves in the tough times. We did it through the financial crisis and we've done it again through COVID. The directors put a lot of money away in 2020, 2019 before our year end is January. So 2020 is really the 2019 calendar year, really. The directors put a lot of money away in that year. And then they drew on those reserves to keep growing the dividend, albeit at a fairly modest pace through the pandemic. And then last year, the dividend was well covered again. Uh, in terms of reserves, we still have 16 pence of reserves, which is about half a year's dividend um, in reserves. So we're still in a good position there. And then the other thing is performance. Clearly, uh, we're not just trying to deliver good income. We're trying to deliver a good performance record as well. And the total return of both the share price and the NAV is shown in the blue colors here compared to the benchmark over the last decade. We've delivered strong outperformance of the benchmark. And we also show at the bottom of page the performance of the equity portfolio. So stripping out gearing. And again, we've delivered strong outperformance over uh, three years, five years, 10 years. And that's despite having a value investment approach in a time when value vesting has been out of favor. We think if we get a following wind of, of value uh, investing performing better generally, we should be able to perform uh, very well as well. And then finally on gearing, the portfolio, the company can borrow money. We have about 110 million of debt, which is about 14% gearing at the end of the year. The typical range is to be between 10 and 25% geared. And that borrowing is broken down between long-term 2035, sorry, 2052 bonds, medium-term, and, and short term, more flexible debt. Some of that is floating, some of that is fixed debt. And the average cost of debt is about 4.7%. And that has come down significantly from what was 8.5% in 2017. So the debt is much more reasonably priced. And the idea behind debt is if you can deliver a better return on the portfolio than the cost of debt, that should enhance the long term return. But of course, there is slightly higher risk with that. So when markets go up, we tend to do better. When markets go down, we tend to do worse because of the gearing. But in the long term, and we take a long term view of gearing, that should hopefully enhance returns if we can deliver a, a return better than the cost of debt. Um, so just in conclusion, I've covered a lot of ground. Very happy to take questions. Merchants Trust has a high yield, about 5%. It's an AIC dividend hero. We've grown that dividend every year for 41 years. We've got a really strong performance record driven by active high conviction stock selection, but with a value tilt. And we have a, a modest management fee with an experienced independent board of directors. And at that point, I'll hand it over to questions. Thank you very much. Simon, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for that presentation. Um, that's great. Uh, we have some questions that have, have come through. So thank you, everybody, for sending in questions. I'll just add that if you'd like to send in questions now, you, you can continue to do so. Um, just want to have a think about that. So please continue to do that. Um, so, Simon, we've, we've got some questions on. Why don't we kick off with the, with the top one? It's, um, it's to do with the size of the stocks within your portfolio, saying you, you've got a fund size of 900 million, guessing there's 40 to 60 stocks or so in the portfolio. That's going to constrain you a little bit in terms of market cap. So what, what is the typical market cap range that you invest in is the question. Okay, that's a great question. So, um on the page I showed very quickly, uh, we do break down the portfolio between FTSE 100, which is 54.4%. Uh, mid cap, about a third of the portfolio is a mid cap. Uh, we've got about 6% in small cap. So these are outside of the uh, the top 350 companies in the UK. And we've got 3.5% non-UK. So those are those tend to typically large European companies. So we're nearly 60% in large cap if you include the, the European stocks. Um, so we do have some small caps. The smallest would be around about 200 million market cap. Um, we might have smaller positions in those, but we we do like, and there are opportunities there, but in, it, we, we like small companies that can uh, that can grow their way out of it, but are often good value, um, that can grow over time. 
Um, but we tend to be more in the mid cap area. And in fact, at the moment, we find fantastic opportunities in the mid cap area, which has been hit very hard by money flowing out of the uh, out of the UK. Um, and, and I think there's been some pretty indiscriminate selling in the mid cap area. So that's where we are today. And we will always be uh, predominantly in large cap. That's the status objective of the trust, unless the board changes that objective. Uh, so we're likely to have the majority of our portfolio in large cap. But as you can see here, we've got about 40% outside of that. Great. Thank, thanks, Simon. Um, another question. Next question is um, to do with ESG. It says, given ESG concerns, how do you justify Shell and BP both being among your top 10 holdings? Yeah, uh, again, not a really good question. Um, so we don't apply an exclusionary policy. I, we don't exclude many areas. We actually think that divesting from energy companies will, will not really help the, uh, the transition of the economy that we need. And we actually think that both Shell and BP play a really important role in decarbonizing the economy, uh, the, the, you know, decarbonizing the, uh, the society. Uh, and we engage with them a lot. So if you take areas like um, hydrogen, uh, which may be a fuel, an important fuel in the future, in order to manufacture hydrogen at scale and to transport it around the country, you need a many of the skills that companies like Shell have got of being able to run big industrial processes with chemicals, of, of shipping and piping uh, gases around the country, of helping your customers, which will be the fleets of lorries and trucks, uh, to, to, to install hydrogen buying and selling these commodities at scale on global markets um, and so on and so on en engineering skills safety skills um, balance sheet to, to do this we think company like shell is, is front and center of that if you, if you take carbon capture and storage to take carbon out of the environment um, again the big energy companies have fantastic assets they can apply to that um, and at the same time we need gas and we need oil we, we, we need to get rid of coal power as a, as a, as a, uh, which is still being you know still there's still coal fire power coal-fired power stations being built and companies like Shell are producing gas which can hopefully replace coal and be less environmentally damaging in the in the medium term um, before we move to to uh, non-fossil fuel um, energy sources so I think these companies play an, play an important role in decarbonizing um, society over time and I think if we were try, trying to do it without them it would take longer, it would cost more, and it would be less effective. So I have no problem owning BP and Shell from an environmental point of view in the portfolio. And there's also a, a really strong financial argument, which I could talk about as well, but we think these companies are generating mm -hmm. huge amounts of cash um, and have, have very sustainable uh, financial profiles as well. So happy to discuss that if that's a question as well. Great. Thanks, Simon. There's another one of a similar sort of contention, I suppose. So, Simon, I'd, I'd welcome your perspective on tobacco companies whose days are surely numbered. How do you mitigate the risk of your tobacco holdings, profits, dividends and share price dropping off a cliff? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's um, a really good question as well. So if you look at our history back in 2017, when tobacco companies were very popular with many income funds, uh, income investors, we had no tobacco. We sold out completely in the middle of 2017. We thought valuations were too high and we totally acknowledged that fewer people smoke each year. And there are lots of new products coming in which could be competitive. I think what's happened since then is the tobacco shares have derated massively. They are now extremely lowly priced and they're pricing in uh, essentially not existing in maybe a decade or so. So they're priced for um, smoking to disappear completely, which it will probably or may, may do ultimately. It may, it may not. Um, but we don't think it's going to disappear in, in, in the short term. We also think these companies have a, a lot of opportunities in the alternative products, whether that's vaping or um, heat not burn, which are less harmful products. Um, and those can replace um, cigarettes over time. Um, they've also got strong presence in emerging markets where actually smoking trends are somewhat behind um, the West typically. And so that smoking may be more, um, you know, may, may last longer. So I think there are reasons to think that uh, whilst there are pressures on, on cigarette consumption, and, and that's something we spend a lot of time analysing and making sure we're on top of, that it's going to be still, cigarettes are still going to be around for quite a long time. And there, beyond that, there are other products that, that can take their place. And the shares remain extremely lowly priced given the, the potential uh, cash flows they can generate over the next 10, 20 years. So we do see a place, but we are price sensitive and we are, very carefully you know, monitoring developments in the industry. 
And yeah, also, so I should, let me just add, we should, I should talk about the, the, the engagement side. We'd also, also engage with the companies, um, both on the uh, alternative products. We're encouraging them to develop alternative products that are less harmful, but also on the social side, they have a, the tobacco industry uh, can be quite harmful um, in terms of for the farmers. We, look, we talk about protection of the farmers and we look a lot about um, child labor in the tobacco fields is a big issue that the tobacco companies are trying to um, uh, eradicate and we are uh, in, in engaging with them on that issue as well. Yeah. Um, there's another one here about gearing that starts with um, a thank you uh, for the presentation. It says 25% as a top end of your gearing range seems high, what conditions would push you to gear up to that extent? Uh, am I right in assuming the cost of borrowing now would stop you from increasing your gearing, even if valuations are attractive? Um, yeah, it's all, all good questions. So I think uh, the directors mm -hmm. decide, on, decide on the gearing policy. Um, I suppose the times when we would have, theoretically the times when we would have want to have the most gearing would be when the market is... Uh, depressed, so valuations are attractive, and ideally when the cost of debt is low, and then you can lock in um, cheap debt and and um, good opportunities in the market. I mean, at the moment the cost of debt is quite reasonable, I would say, um, and the market is actually very cheap, but you know it could get cheaper. And, and I suppose the one concern I've got is probably more globally that some equity markets, particularly the US, look more extended, and it's very rare for the US market to come down without the UK market having some sort of impact so um we those are the conditions i think where the directors might want to increase gearing is that they have a lot of confidence in the outlook for equities um equity valuations are low and gearing was cheap i think we are quite a quite an attractive position in that uh, would we get up to the top of the range i, I don't know i mean that, that ultimately is a question for the board um of course what happens mathematically or you know sort of automatically is as the market goes down the gearing goes up because we have a fixed amount of, of debt. Uh, and whilst we can flex that with a revolving credit, credit facility, we normally allow the gearing to go up into falling markets. So there's an automatic side, I suppose, where gearing will go up as markets get cheaper. And I think that's appropriate. Um, so even if we were, uh, you know, for 15 percent today, if the market was set to come to come down a lot, the gearing would automatically go up. I think in the past, gearing has been higher than that. It is true. We have we have reduced gearing quite a bit in recent years, partly because the market's recovered uh, and partly because we've been issuing quite a lot of shares uh, and growing the trust and we've not not fully replaced the gearing. So uh, I think we're very comfortable where we are. I wouldn't want to say what conditions the directors will take that up to the top of the range, but um, it, it also it probably allows for, for an element of gearing going up as the market comes down. I hope that answers it. Uh, I'm happy to take a follow on if there is. Great. Thank you, Simon. So, Next one um, is you list Inchcape as a recent addition and M&G as a disposal. Can you talk a little bit about those decisions? Yes, absolutely. So Inchcape, uh, curiously, uh, I'm, let me just see, I may even have a slide on it. Uh, no, I, don't have, I don't have an example on, on Inchcape. Inchcape is a company we've owned before, actually, and, and um, we sold out of it in, um, let me just go to the page, here we go. We sold out of it in 2021. Uh, and Inchcape, what they do is they are primarily a, a car distributor. So you, you're not a retailer. They, they, do, they do run one or two car showrooms, but that's not what most of what they do. They distribute cars. So if you, if you were to buy, go to look at Toyota in Hong Kong, Toyota is represented by Inchcape in Hong Kong, have been for 50 years. And pretty much everything Toyota do in Hong Kong is actually Inchcape uh, in, in terms of the marketing, in terms of the import and export of the, of the cars, uh, in terms of working with the dealerships to sell cars, in terms of supplying spare parts and finance packages. They do all of that. They now work for something like 40, over 40 brands in over 40 markets around the world where they have exclusive distribution arrangements, including over a dozen brands in Chile, which is their biggest market, uh, where they have you know many, a, a number of Chinese brands as well as uh, some of the Japanese brands and, 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 and some of the German ones. Um, so these are really powerful, strong strategic relationships. And the reason the car manufacturers do it is if you're Mercedes or BMW, you, you want to control, you want to distribute yourself in America, in, U, in the UK, in Germany, in China, in the big markets. But in the smaller markets, it's, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of bother. 
and it's not something that's core to your strategy. So they, they want people like Inchicape to do it. But they also need partners with scale with um, who can who can who have digital capabilities to offer you know a digital interface to the consumer, but also a digital interface back to the company to sell services, to sell software, uh, financial services, and so on. So Inchicape have a lot of capabilities which make it quite hard for smaller com companies to compete, and they're hoovering up smaller franchises from family-owned businesses. They've made acquisitions, but also recently they were given the Indonesian franchise from, from Mercedes. In fact, they've just announced another deal with a great wall, um, with, a, with, a, with, a, sorry, with a large Chinese manufacturer, to, to, uh, and their first step is into Indonesia as well. So, sorry, it's a long answer. They, they, so they've got this really strong business, which is growing, um, taking share from, from in a fragmented market. And the share price has come down a long way since we sold in 2021, as the business has got stronger. And there's been a great opportunity to get back in at a really attractive price. So it's a good business, some really powerful long-term themes for what they're doing, and, and an interesting valuation. That's why we've come back into it. M&G was a very small position in the, in the fund. Um, we inherited it when Prudential demerged M&G. Um, we never had a really high conviction in it. Um, and so we didn't build that position up. It was, as I say, it was a very small position. And we just, it was one of those situations where we had stronger ideas elsewhere. And so we sold it to finance that. We, we didn't have a negative view on M&G, but we didn't really have a, a very high conviction position either, which is why we, we use that to fund other positions. Thanks, Simon. Um, another one, I guess, somewhat similar is, it says, um, you say that you sold BAE, you said that you sold BAE, do you have any money in defence stocks at all now? Is that sector still attractive? Uh, we don't actually anymore. So BA was uh, our biggest. We used to own a company called Megit, which is a, a aerospace component manufacturer, uh, aerospace components manufacturer, made wheels and brakes, and they made a lot of defence equipment that was taken over actually a couple of years ago. Uh, and BA was a very large position that has been for many years in the trust. Uh, we thought it was fully valued after the shares pretty much doubled over the last 18 months or so. Um, it's a really strong business. We like the outlook. We, we, we're positive on the outlook and we think it's company's well run, but we didn't see a positive investment case anymore. So we sold it. And no, we don't have any other uh, major defense exposure in the in the portfolio. I'm sure there's there are products that will go into defense, but not not defense companies. Okay. Um, there's another question to do with gearing, which is uh, with interest rates predicted to reach 6% by the end of the year. Can you talk about your debt maturity dates and to what extent you are exposed to having to refinance your debt at a time of high interest rates? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So um, the we've got the, the longest maturity we've got is, is still 30 years, so 2052. 29 years that's at three percent so that's a very attractive bond we took out um, or debt we took out uh, five years ago we still got a 2029 bond um, which is again still six years off that's at around about six percent so that's quite close to current yields but you probably wouldn't get that if you applied if you tried to get it today so that's also attractive so about two-thirds just under two-thirds of the debt is very long term. There's a very small perpetual debt instrument, or two of them actually as well, um, and and just over a third, 38%, is our revolving credit facility. Uh, so that's floating rates. Uh, so that's uh, you know that's becoming more expensive, but it's it's still still a reasonable price um, cost. And there 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 the board have flexibility, so we could we could reduce that, and pay some of it down if we if the board thought it was too expensive, um, or potentially we could. Uh, increase that, although we have we have used that facility fully at the moment. Um, so that's the maturity. About a third of it is floating. We don't have any other maturities for six years, so we're in, we're in a good position. Um, but it is the debt structure is something the board keeps under very close review. Comes up in most board meetings, uh, and we're always we're always considering the long term. But we're we're comfortable having about a third long term, a third medium term, and a third short term. Great. Um, next question then is, um, what do you think of the recent proposals for overhauling the UK market's governance structure? Uh, great question. Uh, I, I've been quite involved in, in that to some extent in, from, from our, come from Allianz Global Investors side. Um, I think what the UK government's trying to do is make the UK stock market more attractive for companies to list 
and and uh, I suppose over time to raise the valuation in the UK as well. Um, so there are certain things that uh, there are certain things that they can do to ease the restraints. One one of the problems companies have. There's lots of reasons why companies don't necessarily list in the UK. Um, valuation is a big part of that, but. There are there are restrictions on dual, dual dual class shareholdings. There are two 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 types of companies in the UK. Two listings. There's a prime. Uh, there's the uh, premier listing um, and a standard listing, um, and the uh, sorry premium listing. And and many companies can't get into the premium listing. So what the government's talking about, what the FCA is talking about with their consultation, is consolidating that into one type of listing. And making it easier for companies, for example, the companies without a three-year track record to list in the stock market, I think that's okay. Uh, some of that's okay, shall I, shall I say? So, if a company has a two-year track record, we can understand that when we look at the prospectus when we meet them. We don't necessarily need three years of information. I think where it gets more problematic is some of the protections out there for shareholders and minority shareholders in particular. So for example, at the moment, if a company wants to do a transaction with a related party, trans company, uh, related party, so for example, a large shareholder in the company, if they want to buy or sell, let's say the company wants to buy a, a property from a, from a major shareholder in the company, at the moment, that, will, that type of transaction will always go for, for a vote. Um, and there are some proposals that might water those protections down. We think the government needs to look very carefully, or the FCA needs to consider very carefully shareholder protections, because I think one of the things that makes the UK attractive as a market is there are strong shareholder protections, strong governance on, on some of these issues. And it's a very fine line between easing restrictions to get more companies into the UK, but also maintaining uh, strong strong protections for minority shareholders and, and uh, in fact, for all shareholders. Uh, and strong sense of governance. And uh, I think getting that li that line right is really important because if you go too far, you might actually damage the market as well. So it's not all about loosening the restrictions. It's it's also about getting the right level of protection. So I think it's a really good question. We could talk a lot more about it. I think many of the reforms the FCA is talking about uh, are positive, but there are some areas where I think we need to tread very carefully uh, and, 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 and take our time on some of these issues, for example, dual class, class shareholder shares already there have already been changes to allow companies to list with dual classes of shares, um, but they're under certain conditions. We need to see how those bed in over time. So yeah, thank you for that question. Great, um, thank you very much, Simon. We we've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, did you would you like to give us any concluding final comments? before we wrap up? Very happy to. I think that's really interesting questions. I think um, what we're finding at the moment is is a, a fascinating market as a stock pick. There's some great opportunities, really polarized uh, perceptions of, of you know what people, what investors want and what they don't want. I mean, that's throwing up opportunities to buy really strong businesses with decent dividend yields and good valuations. Um, and that's a really exciting time to be a stock picker. What we're trying to do at Merchants is deliver a high and rising income stream, which we've done uh, consistently for 41 years. Um, we want to continue to deliver a strong performance record through its active, high conviction, value oriented portfolio. I think the opportunities today give me a lot of confidence that we can deliver strong performance in the future. Um, but of course, there, there can be no guarantees of that, of course. Um, and we have uh, a low management fee, uh, 35 basis points on gross assets and a really in strong independent board. I haven't said much about that, but they, they do challenge us, they hold us to account and they represent the shareholders. So uh, I think it's a really um, interesting time to be looking at the UK market and investing in UK shares. And um, I thank you all for your, your time and your attention today. Simon, thanks. Thanks very much indeed for your presentation for answering all those questions. Thank you all investors for attending and taking the time to to, to join us today. That's very much appreciated. Um, if I could ask you just to hold on a little bit longer because there is a, um, a feedback survey that you'll be automatically directed to. But um, yeah, thank you all very much indeed for, for, for joining us today.